Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled, The Anatomy of a Court Case for Genealogist. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner. We're here for another webinar from the Brigham Young University Family History Library on the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And to remind all the viewers here that these webinars are recorded and uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel uh, where they can be viewed. And if you are interested, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel and be notified of the any new videos that are uploaded. We just checked and we now have 173 as of the date of this particular broadcast, uh, 173 uh, different videos up online there. Okay, well, we're going to talk about the anatomy of a court case for genealogists. And if you probably listened to that long spiel about whoever I am, uh, you realize that one of the things that I did was to be a lawyer for a long time. So we'll talk about some of the, the uh, terminology and uh, how we go, and particularly a little more uh, in depth about how you go about finding all of these different court cases that are out, th out there. OK, so the first thing to understand is that your ancestors may have been involved in a court case. Now, uh, it's it just the sheer numbers of court cases that have been uh, filed in the United States and in England and other places uh, probably mandates that nearly everybody had some kind of brush with the courts during their lifetime, even if they didn't get sued during their lifetime or sue somebody during their lifetime and go to court or get hauled into court because they were arrested or some other uh, something else happened. It may be that ultimately when they died, their estate was probated and that went into another court case. Uh, so we have all sorts of ways that people could have been involved with the court. As a matter of fact, uh, the largest body of, of, uh, of records out there uh, that are available for genealogical research include land and property records. And I would put court records right after land and property records. Now just kind of as a little bit of a preview, None of these records, neither land nor no, and property records nor court records, are generally considered to be genealogical records. So they don't end up in, uh, in a lot of the bit larger genealogical uh, database websites like uh, FamilySearch, Ancestry, MyHeritage, uh, Find My Past, or whatever. Uh, if you go into those cases, and I'll show you here uh, in just a minute, you probably, in those into those websites, you're probably not going to find a lot of court cases, maybe probate, but probably nothing else. So what can court records show? What are some of the things that we might find if we looked into uh, all of these vast number of court cases and court records that have been generated in, uh, in the United States over the years? First thing is you can usually find records that identify the identities of family members and their relationship. Um, one example recently was uh, uh, doing research uh, on an ancestor who was uh, what we would call elusive, meaning where we couldn't find very many records. After searching book by book through the books on the shelf in the BYU uh, Harold Beely Library for Vermont, I was able to find a book with transcriptions of probate files, which then confirmed the identity of this particular ancestor and the members of the, of the ancestor's family. 
So this, this uh, in this case, a probate file, which is part of a court case file, would be, uh, is a valuable, was a valuable way to identify all of the members of this family. The second thing that court records may show is a woman's maiden name. Um, this comes about as a result of the fact that, that a lot of cases where you had to go into court and uh, the uh, involved, uh, for instance, an action for what we call dower, a dower interest. Uh, this was a, an action where uh, the wife uh, was, um, when she got married, when the lady got married, she brought certain property to the marital, what we call the marital community, the, the, the community of the husband and the wife as they, as they become married. And this marital, uh, the marital community, the, this, whatever the husband and wife own, in most states there was a, uh, a law in the eastern part of the United States primarily, and there were exceptions in what are called common law states, I mean uh, community property states. But in, a, in, in these certain states in the United States, originally there was a unity of ownership in uh, the marital, in the, between the married partners, the parties to the marriage, and the husband was the unity. In other words, the husband owned and could dispose of any of the property that, that uh, was owned by the husband and the wife jointly after they got married. Uh, this, of course, was not the best of all possible worlds for, the, for women. But um, what did happen was that the law had what was called her dower right. So any property that, in which she may have had an interest during her life, she obtained an interest upon her husband's death. Now, let's give you a scenario that how this could end up in court and how you might know, find out what the woman's maiden name was. Uh, so the woman, uh, so the husband during the lifetime of the, of, of his, as his lifetime, and while he was married to the to the woman with the dower interest, sells the property. Now he could do that legally under the under the laws in the United States at the time. They there was no particular uh, the right the woman had no right to say anything about whether the property was sold or not. So then the husband dies, and then the property is uh, his property is distributed. The woman, unless she had given up her dower right, then had a right to go back into court and compel the court to have the property sold during her uh, during the time that there was what's called coverture, which is another word for during the time of the marriage. That they uh, the, during coverture during the time that there was the marriage was in effect could have it returned her interest in that property returned to her. In other words, they may have to sell the property or read or deed the property back to the wife. Okay, so this was uh, uh, this was a way that that you would probably end up learning what the wife's maiden name was because they would have to tell where she got her dower rights, and so they'd have to identify that who she was before she got married. So there's a lot of ways that uh, that, that the when you get into these court cases that a lot of this information that sometimes is not easily discovered by genealogical research can uh, can be found. Another thing that court records may show is the ownership of land and property. Uh, a lot of people in uh, the United States uh, sued each other about land and property. Uh, one of the most common lawsuits out there dealing with land and property, of course, are boundaries disputes and uh, people who uh, want to sue their neighbors because the fence line uh, is moved one way or the other. Um, in a result of those cases for genealogical interest is that you begin to know and understand who owns all of this property and what the exact boundaries were between the properties. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, another thing that comes out in court records uh, from time to time, and, and usually pretty regularly, are religious and ethnic identities and other details about the person's life. Um, there's an interesting thing about law cases is that uh, there's a, a part of the law case called the discovery process, which we'll talk about in, more, in a minute here. 
but, but the results of having discovery means that they can find out information about the opposing party. So the, the person suing, the, filing the lawsuit has a right to find out from the people who are being sued certain information and vice versa. They can also, people who are being sued can find out information from the person filing the lawsuit. So in this case, um, it says they have echoes. Sorry if you're getting an echo. Um, so what happens in those cases is that uh, they obtain affidavits, or in another case, they can get um, oral testimony. Basically, uh, that testimony is then transcribed as what's called a deposition. And so those depositions can show all sorts of information about the party being deposed or the person giving an affidavit. Up, up. I guess I got to click down here. There we go. The last thing you find out from lawsuits in a lot of cases is the economic status of your ancestor if they appear. Um, a probate case, for example, might show that the person had very little in the world in the sense of goods and, and ownership or may have a very large estate. So you can see uh, how rich they were in a sense or how poor they were uh, from the lawsuit. In addition, there are other lawsuits, uh, situations where, uh, for instance, a bankruptcy case, which uh, it would indicate the person had no money, or there were a series of collection cases made by creditors uh, trying to get money out of uh, your uh, deadbeat lands ancestor who wouldn't pay his bills or couldn't pay his bills. So anyway, these are all ways that, that give you insights and information uh, about your ancestors that you may not otherwise find and can fill in details uh, of birth dates, uh, death dates, uh, all sorts of information is possible in, in, uh, to be found in a, in a court record. Um, okay, now we got to mention criminal lawsuits. First of all, um, a criminal lawsuit is brought by the government. Uh, it's an individual is uh, uh, if you're suing uh, somebody in a civil suit, that can be brought by anyone. But all criminal lawsuits are brought by some branch of the government, a municipal, uh, county, state, wherever it is that has jurisdiction over that particular uh, crime uh, is the one who brings the criminal lawsuit. And what is and what is not a criminal act is defined by criminal law statutes. So when people say something is against the law, and they use that term all the time, oh, what you're doing is against the law. Well, not necessarily. And the answer to that is there are very specific criminals to statutes in each state in the United States that define what is and what is not a criminal law. And in the federal courts, federal, there is also federal laws that define what is not, what is and what is not a criminal act. So when you're talking about doing something against the law, what you're, what you're implying there is that a person is committing a criminal act that is against the statutes. Otherwise, anything else in the law, the civil law, is not nearly as, uh, as defined, as well defined as the, the criminal statutes. And also in criminal lawsuits, the penalty is always incarceration or a fine. So you're not going to end up in jail because somebody sues you civilly unless it happens to end up in a, as a violation of a criminal statute and, and the state brings an action against you and charges you with a crime. Now, civil lawsuits are on the other side of that. And the civil lawsuits are actions between two private parties. So if you, uh, or more, obviously, uh, as many parties as they as wish to join in the lawsuit. Uh, but the actions between, they're, they're, they can involve the government. A government can be sued civilly, and the government can sue you civilly. If you happen to damage um, federal property, for example, they may sue you for, uh, for the damage to the property, 
and that may not be a criminal action. They may simply want to get repaid or reimbursed for the damage that you've caused. And usually involves claims for damages. In our system, the, the, the primary way of, of uh, resolving differences between people is to pay money back and forth. Uh, we really can't, if you got uh, your arm broken in an accident, and you wanted to uh, get money paid for your doctor bills and for the, your pain and suffering and for all the problems that were caused, uh, then you would be entitled to money damages. They really can't do much to repair your arm or uh, bring your car back or any of that. Uh, maybe they can repair it and maybe not, but usually everything that happens in civil cases ends up being money judgments for, for a certain amount of money. There are some exceptions, but uh, it's commonly for damages. And as I mentioned, they can be, a civil lawsuit can be brought by a governmental agency, meaning you know, you could get sued civilly by uh, the Bureau of Land Management or uh, by any other agency out there, but uh, those are not criminal actions. They're not going to end up with you going to jail. So if there are no criminal penalties or incarceration involved, then everything that comes out of a civil lawsuit is basically based on awarding a judgment for, for money damages or some other uh, relief that's available to you through the court system. Okay, now one thing that's the reality of the law world is that you have a lot of legal terms out there. And uh, quite frankly, it's like uh, a foreign language. And it takes uh, almost as much study as learning a language uh, as if you were going to learn French or German or whatever non-English language or if you spoke an, if you don't speak already speak the language. The effort you would have to, to learn that language is about the effort it takes to learn how to, how to uh, as they say in law school, make a sound like a lawyer. Or, they put it a little bit different. They usually say, make a noise like a lawyer. Uh, so what we have here is one basic book, re really. When you boil it all down, Black's Law Dictionary, which has been published since the 1800s and updated regularly. And uh, in that case, uh, this book has uh, all of the information. This one book is the one reference book that's the go-to book from all of the lawyers. Uh, nearly every lawyer I knew in my practice of law had a copy of Black's Law Dictionary somewhere around the office that they had to refer to. And most of them, if, especially if they were trial lawyers, where they went to trial frequently like I did, uh, usually had a copy within arm's length where you could grab it whenever you needed it. Now, uh, bear in mind that most of my law career I spent uh, before there were uh, very, very common computer programs. And now all of this is on computer, as I'll show in just a second here. So this is uh, on Black's Law Dictionary is actually online and in print. There are complete, some of the older copies. And, and uh, by the way, uh, old copies, and in, in for law, old is good, meaning that uh, even if you have an old copy of Black's Law Dictionary, it's probably perfectly suitable for what you need to know to do genealogical research because it's been published and contains terms going back hundreds of years in law. Okay, so one way to find the, the meaning or define a legal term, let's say somebody throws in a word like, uh, you're reading a law case and there's a word like assumpset or uh, replevin or uh, demur or something like that, some all of these different terms that are out there. Um, the, the best place to go today is to go into Google search and on your Google, uh, where you would type in an address in Google, you put the word define and then follow it by a space and, and then put the word you want to know what it means. So if you were uh, wanting to know the, the, the meaning of the word demur, you would put in define space D-E-M-M-U-R-R-E-R, -E -R -R -E -R, demur. And uh, even if you misspell it, by the way, uh, Google will suggest the correct spelling and get you to the to the meaning of the word and probably give you 10 or 15 different dictionary meanings of that particular word, including, if you look carefully, Black's Law Dictionary. So 
that's the easy way to get into all this legal terms. Now, and now how did this work? Well, one of the things that happened when I was in law school is before the law school, my first year of law school, I uh, managed to get a job as a reference librarian in the ASU Law Library. Uh, and because of my uh, work there in the ASU Law Library, I was actually there in the library when school started. So I got to see all the new first-year students come in uh, to their classes. Now, as soon as the first few classes were over, and I can remember this distinctly, uh, the, uh, you know, the bell would ring, the students would get up and out of the class, and there would be this almost frantic mass run for the library to grab the dictionaries. Now, the reason was they just sat through a class, a legal class, from the professor who has used probably more words that they don't know the meaning of than any time they've ever been in their life unless they traveled in a foreign country. So uh, they were there trying to find the meaning of the words. It was very entertaining to me to watch them come in and just sort of in mass try to uh, try to grab dictionaries off the shelves. So uh, it was uh, it was this is the process. So even if you were to go to law school, you would still have to go through the process of learning all these terms. Now let's talk about how we go about beginning a uh, a civil lawsuit. Now, whatever the document is called, because over time, uh, if you go back to the 1600s or even the 1500s in England, um, you're going to find that some of the documents have been called different things. In other words, there's uh, sometimes you uh, have a word like a writ rather than a complaint. And so there's all sorts of uh, different terminology. That's why we have the need to go back to the dictionary. Because when we see this word in print, or we see it in a court case, if we don't know the meaning of that word, then you absolutely have to go look it up. Because there, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole issue of what happened in that lawsuit may revolve around the meaning of one word. So if, if you don't really know what happened, uh, then um, you really need to go out and look to make sure these lawsuits. One thing that used to happen regularly as I was practicing law is my clients would always want to go to court with me. Well, usually we were down in court on what, what I would call a routine matter, something like setting the calendar, deciding when a case was going to go to trial, or, or uh, talking about some motion that was, uh, that was pending before the court that needed to be decided, uh, something that needed to be decided by the court. So are the judge in this case. Court and judge in this context are synonymous. So we, we would all go down to court. Well, they want to go. My client would say, oh, you're going to court. Can I come? And am I supposed to be there? And I said, well, you, you don't need to be there. But I always told people that they were welcome to come to court if they wanted to. Well, we would go to court. Uh, we'd go and sit there, wait for our case to be called, go up to the, to the judge. I would talk. The other attorney would talk. The judge would talk. And then we would walk out after whatever was conducted that day was through, uh, invariably. I, I never saw this not happen, uh, was that my client would turn to me and he would say, he or she would say, tell me what happened. And I would have to explain then what, what they'd just gone through in court. And then when they get through, they would say, well, I didn't need to be here. And I said, I tried to tell you that, but you <laughs> wanted to come down, so you're here. That's great. You're welcome to come anytime. Well, from that, usually from that point on, they would not, uh, they would not uh, uh, come to court with me. In the most common way in the United States, the lawsuit begins with a document called a complaint, and a complaint is, is uh, in this case, you can see an old complaint there. It's handwritten. Uh, today, we have uh, typewritten, computer-generated complaints. And in fact, uh, many of the courts in the United States, uh, like uh, had happened in the Maricopa County uh, Court in Arizona, where I was practicing law, uh, have gone to a completely electronic system. So you no longer file paper with the court. You file all your documents electronically, which is good for, attorney, for genealogists, because now all of those documents are online and searchable. So um, a, once they file a complaint, 
from there, as I like to say, things get complicated. Uh, complaints are pretty straightforward. They're saying, I am damaged in some way, or I want the court to do something. And they're asking the court to, uh, to give a judgment against someone else uh, and award them what they would like to have done. So that's how we, that's how we get into court. So the first document that's, that's uh, filed in court, this complaint, um, the, the problem here is, of course, is that you can file a complaint with the court, but that doesn't mean the person that you're suing, the person who is supposed to answer that complaint or respond to that complaint, knows that it exists. So the, the court has set up a system where a complaint is, is uh, served or given to the opposing party, the per party being sued. So what happens is there's a, another document created called a summons. And the summons says uh, to you, party, the other person, uh, whoever you are, uh, that, that the plaintiff or whoever the person is has filed the complaint. And uh, you must appear and answer that complaint. And then that summons is sent out for what's called service of process. That's just a term. I don't know what that actually means, but it's just it's all one word to me, service of process, which means that you're going to hand the summons to the person who being sued. Now, the, the, the court official that does this can be any, anybody that's out there that's either been hired by the court, which is not usually the case, Usually they are a constable or a some other official. Uh, sometimes they're, they're private process servers who go out and do this, but they have to be registered and recognized by the court. So this paper, when I say that, what it means is that a physical copy of the document has to be delivered directly to the person who is being sued. And that's then, once that happens, then there's what's called a return of service. So if you've ever been sued, you know what happened is you got a knock on your door, you opened the door, and a person was standing there, and they said, I have something for you. Are you so-and-so? And you say, yes, I am. And they say, well, here, thanks, goodbye. And that was it. In other words, you open it up, and you find out that you've been served with a lawsuit. Um, so there's, uh, you know, the people who do the service of process uh, by the way, uh, the ones that I've known personally usually were armed and uh, knew how to defend themselves because uh, they were not necessarily received with open arms and gratitude because they were suing, serving people with a lawsuit. Uh, and there you know, are quite a lot of stories. But this all uh, is part of what you will find in a court file is all this information about whether they could find them, whether they couldn't find them, and so forth. Now, after that, a lot can happen. And we need to remind ourselves of the person filing the complaint. That's the person writing up the document, filing it with the court, and asking for some kind of relief from the court is called the plaintiff. And the other side is called the defendant. If there's lots of defendants, there may be lots of plaintiffs and lots of defendants, but they're all called plaintiffs and defendants. And in, in some cases, the defendant may choose, for whatever reason, because they don't have any money, or because they just don't care, or because they're you know, not competent, or whatever, they may not answer the lawsuit, in which case the court can do what's called enter a default. They can determine that the time limits for answering this particular lawsuit have, have passed, and so, therefore, the defendant who has failed to answer is in default. Now, you can choose to go into default. In other words, you can read this and say, well, even if they win, it's not going to mean anything to me, so why should I spend any money defending this lawsuit? And so you can let it go to default if you wish to have it do it. Or if you agree with the plaintiff, for example, you may be sued simply because there's some legal requirement that you be included in the lawsuit and you really are rooting for the, the plaintiff's side of the lawsuit. So you certainly don't want to spend money answering it or uh, opposing what it is the plaintiff's trying to accomplish. So this is a, there's a lot of reasons here. And then the plaintiff may also fail to serve the complaint, and the case might be dismissed. Uh, this runs into a whole long record of where uh, the defendants 
uh, try to avoid service of process by hiding out or by try not to give their name properly or whatever it is they do. Generally speaking, that's not effective because if the court kind of suspects that the that the defendant is avoiding service of process, uh, trying not to be found or hiding from the law, uh, then you can uh, the, the plaintiff can apply to the court and obtain a default judgment. That means they can go ahead and, and have the person served perhaps by publication in a newspaper or whatever. Now if you think about what's what I'm talking about here, you realize that every one of the documents that's being filed here in the case and every bit of procedure that's going on, including like newspaper anna uh, announcements and things like that, are all documents that you can discover as genealogical researchers. And they may give you information about your family. So these are why they're valuable records, because people get in there and start talking about who they are and why they are and what they need. And uh, the other side comes back and says, you don't need it, and you're not going to win, and we're going to win, and so forth. OK. This part of the rules of what, how all this happens is, is the, called civil procedure. It's sort of the rules of the game of how you proceed in these lawsuits. And uh, in this case, for example, once there's a complaint, a person could file what's called an answer to the complaint. Now, historically, that word that I used earlier, demur, was uh, one of the words they used for an answer. It, it means either an answer or what's often called a motion to dismiss. Uh, that is a different way of answering. So they could answer, they could file this motion to dismiss, they could uh, file what's called a counterclaim. The motion to dismiss says uh, your complaint isn't legally enforceable, that for some reason it's defective and we want the court to dismiss it because you really don't have a right to file that kind of a lawsuit at all. And that happens from time to time. That's not impossible. That's something that happens. So the lawsuit might end up being relatively short if the motion to dismiss were granted. Well, then what happens is you might have a counterclaim. In other words, the other party who sued, the defendant, would uh, say, well, really, you owe me the money. I don't owe you the money. Uh, you owe me the money. Or you owe me more money than I owe you. So in those cases, they would file a counterclaim. Now, there are certain things that are called um, uh, absolute, they're called uh, counterclaims that must be filed. Um, they're not what are called permissive, they're mandatory, which means that if you don't file it, you lose it. So there's all sorts of rules and, and all sorts of things. And this, it just gets more and more complicated. Now there's also a third party claim, and that is I could end up saying, well, I'm not liable for your claim. My This guy over here is. And so there's like a three-party thing where the first person sues the second person, the second person sues the third person. And then sometimes the third person can actually go back and sue the first person. So we can go around in a big circle there. And this can go on and on and on and on. So uh, we're just barely skimming the top of the possibility of the number of, uh, of, of different pieces of paper, different motions and pleadings, as they're called, that could be filed in a lawsuit uh, before the court. Uh, now, let me kind of tell you about a little bit about time frame here. Uh, basically, uh, you might have to search records for the entire life of the time of the client of your, excuse me, not client, but your uh, ancestor, and maybe for many, many, many years afterwards, uh, because you never know how long it might have been before somebody had to file a lawsuit. And even after your your uh, your ancestor died, uh, if it's, it is possible that, that 10, 20 years later, even longer, that somebody decided to bring an action that would involve your ancestor's estate Okay, so for example, and I just give one more example. When I began 
going to law school, there was a, a room in the law school library, which was a fairly good sized room, as probably 20 by 20 or maybe a little larger than that. And it was floor to ceiling with, with uh, bookcases uh, up about eight or nine feet and all the way around the room. And what it turned out was this was the record of the case of one lawsuit. Uh, probably 10,000 or more documents, probably many more than 10,000, probably hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. And uh, this one lawsuit happened to be called uh, the uh, Colorado River adjudication. It was, a, it was a, a lawsuit between Arizona, California, Nevada, uh, Utah, Colorado, and um, I think that was all the states that were involved. So this is, uh, this is a huge lawsuit that went on for years and years and years. And, and uh, it's, very it's very possible that one of your ancestors, if they lived in that area, somehow got involved with that lawsuit one way or the other. So these are, these, these are things that uh, could very, very much uh, have affected the way that your, uh, whatever happened to your life. Okay, so it's interesting to, it's important to understand the difference between procedure and the law. Now, uh, I can say this, but I also know from experience in going through law school and then dealing with lawyers after uh, they've graduated from law school, that this is not a concept that uh, seems obvious or, uh, or is easily understood. So it's kind of hard to understand what, what the difference is, what the split is between what we call the law and the procedure. So the procedure is the, um, are the, is the rules of the game. This is telling you uh, how long, how, what you can do, what kind of paper you can put your, com your complaint on, how it has to be signed, uh, how it has to be served on the other party, uh, what, how much time they have to answer. Uh, everything that has to do with the conduct of the lawsuit is procedure. And what happens, I think, as we go through law school is that we get about 90% law and about 10% procedure, usually. And so most of the people who are uh, graduating from law school are far from prepared to walk out and go into court. Now, some of the law schools attempt to, to give you some uh, real trial experience they have what are called mock trials where you can pretend to be a lawyer and go in and, and try cases and things like that. But the reality of all this is that uh, um, most of the attorneys are not ready to go into court and, be, and practice law when they get out of law school. It takes a few, a few years to really get yourself under, to get understanding how all of this stuff works. Now, the law part of it is, it's either statutes passed by the legislature, like criminal statutes or any of the other statutes that are out there, big long sets of books of these statutes, and now they're all online, uh, or case law decided by a, a judge or court. The court decides or the judge decides they're the same thing. So the case law becomes law through a process that we call stare decisis. It's S-T-A-R-E-D-E-C-I-S. And um, um, C-I-S-I-S, -I -S, excuse me, there's another I-S at the end of that. So what happens here is that uh, what people think becoming a lawyer is, is going into a law school and learning uh, the law. In other words, sitting down and trying to memorize all this stuff. The answer is absolutely not. We don't really care what the law says. Uh, we will go look at it every time we think about it because it, the law changes constantly. And if you memorized the law and it changed, then you'd be in a really bad place. So what, you, what we do is we just simply have to recheck everything every time that we go to court to make sure that nothing has changed since the last time we were in court. So what's a genealogist to do? How are we supposed to handle all this stuff that sounds overwhelmingly complicated? And uh, it sounds like there's a whole lot of things that you don't know. But they're, the, you're being told that records are very, very valuable. And you need to spend some time uh, getting involved with them. 
So here's the first solution. Go to law school, get a law degree, and practice law. That's a good way to get a good uh, grip on how to do research into law cases, court cases, and find the court law, the law. Now, the other one is to make friends with a genealogist lawyer who will talk to you for free. Now, you may not have that, that ability to, uh, to do that, but uh, that's another possibility. The third possibility is get to work with a dictionary and the online searches and figure it out. Uh, that is really the best way to do this. It, uh, there is not a, no reason why a genealogist needs to know enough to become a lawyer. You don't have to know that much. But basically, uh, you do have to know the, the terminology and sort of what the effect of the different lawsuits are that you might find in historical records. So uh, for that reason alone, you probably uh, can get a dictionary and figure this out. Now what about the old legal terms? Um, the, the nature of law is that it's very conservative, but uh, a lot of the old terms uh, that have, were in common practice 50, well, 150, 200, 300 years ago are no longer used. For example, there's a word called a sumset, and that's an action on a contract not under, not under seal. Well, all of that is a legal jargon. So you would have to def go look it up and read about it and see if you could understand it, and then try to figure out what a contract that was not under seal is. And uh, then you would be uh, you would get an idea of what was being talked about in the lawsuit. Then there's the demur word that I've looked it up that I've talked about a couple of times. And that's basically a way, to, a way of, dis, of disputing the efficiency in law of the pleading of the other side. It would be called an answer or a motion to dismiss today. The advantage here is that we have a lot of dictionaries and a lot of old uh, uh, law books that will tell you uh, the meaning of all of these old terms. So we can go online, we can look it up, and we can find um, the meaning of all of, this, all of this different stuff. So it's back to the dictionaries, and that helps us. Now, if it's any consolation, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, most of the practicing attorneys who were, law, who were involved in, in uh, trial practice particularly probably had a copy of a dictionary, a Black's Law Dictionary, sitting on their desk. Now, I don't advocate you going out and buying a copy of a dictionary. I mean, even though you could probably find one in a used bookstore, it would be perfectly serviceable or online as a used copy. But on the other hand, we can use the computer now to look up all of these same terms and get a little bit of background and understanding. OK, when you're looking at and researching a lawsuit, it's important to understand the stages of the lawsuit. How is it that the lawsuit proceeds? So the first stage in a lawsuit is called the pleading stage, and that's where they file the complaints, the answers. All of these documents go back and forth between the parties. Uh, that, that can continue onward until the case, almost until the case is over. But at some point in time, the parties start what's called the discovery stage. At that point, they're allowed to go out and uh, and obtain information about what is the claim, what the claim is about. They can even ask the other party to come in and testify and tell them what what's going on here. Why do we want? Why are you suing my client, or why are you suing me? Okay, so this this is called the discovery stage, and this is where it's very valuable for attorneys. One of the reasons for that is. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a process called taking a deposition, and that is the, the person is called in, whether they're a party or not, uh, they're called into court or into uh, a lawyer office, and they're required under oath, uh, under, under penalty of perjury, to answer questions uh, from an attorney, uh, usually the, opposing, the attorney that's opposing the the position held by the person giving the, the deposition. Depositions are then transcribed usually in some format, uh, or they are published in a book, kind of like a booklet format. And those are those are just 
in the court record. So part of what you might find is an affidavit, which would be a shorter statement, or a deposition, which would be a longer statement, made by your ancestor telling a whole bunch of things about themselves. One of the, the realities of this that we found is that there are people called, the attorneys who take these depositions, who ask the questions, fall into a different categories. And one category of attorneys that I consider is called creation, I call them creationists, having nothing to do with the creation of the world. It has to do with the way they conduct uh, depositions. They will begin by asking, where were you born? Uh, where did you go to grade school? Where did you go to law, high school? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if you happen to run on a lawsuit that has one of these types of attorneys asking questions, you may very well run into uh, a lot of information about your your ancestor that was uh, that you didn't expect to get. Uh, then they all get ready to go to trial, and that's called pretrial preparation. And in that matter, they're putting the evidence together, they're creating exhibits, they're doing things that they need to, to go to court. And they're also filing additional documents with the court uh, about the procedure and things that are going to happen during the trial. Then you go to the trial or other disposition of the case, meaning it finally goes before a judge or a jury or both, and uh, the, the, uh, everybody's going to make a decision about what happened. Okay, once the case is goes to court, then the, the judge or the jury decides who wins and who loses. And then they have to come up with a judgment in favor of the winning party, or they dismiss the case. So uh, it may end at the trial. It may be in before the trial. It could end immediately after filing the complaint, or it could drag on for years and years and years and years. Once the trial has been held, then there are a series of what are called post-trial motions or pleadings. In this case, uh, there's all sorts of things that can be filed. Uh, the basic one is what's called a motion for a new trial. The person who lost the, the case or at the trial or had judgment entered against them uh, now says it was all done wrong and we want it all done over again. Uh, in my experience, those were very, very rarely granted, but they were on occasion. It did happen, and uh, it was uh, rather painful for all the parties because then they had to go back through the whole process over again. Um, at any time, obviously, the parties could settle their differences. They could just simply agree on whatever terms they could agree upon and decide to abandon the lawsuit remedy and go out and settle their law case on their own. So this did happen very carefully. In fact, most of the trials, most of the cases that were on their way to trial were settled. Uh, and that's probably, the, that's probably been true for as long as there have been lawsuits in, in our Western society. After a judgment is entered, then the parties can appeal to a court of appeals or they can, uh, the plaintiff who gets the judgment, the person who gets the judgment, whether plaintiff or defendant, would be uh, able to try to collect the money that they were awarded. Well, all of this is creating paper. You understand that there's going to be documents sitting in a court case file in a court someplace or wherever else there's, they're, they're, they are, as I'll indicate. Then uh, these records are all available for your review their public record information in the United States, court cases are usually, unless some unusual circumstances like adoption or things like that where sometimes the records are sealed. But in most cases, vast majority of the cases, these are all uh, public, uh, public really, uh, made, publicly made uh, documents. And if the judgment is uh, paid for, if the person pays the money that's owed or whatever, then there is a document called a satisfaction of judgment, and that usually means that the lawsuit is over. Now, if there's an appeal, it goes off on a different line, and uh, and the different thing is, is uh, made to be decided by an appeals court. 
Now, the rule here is it's never over until it's over. And I'm looking at a cemetery picture here because that's significant. Uh, that may be the, the, the case. We had one case that went on uh, while I was uh, the last 15 years of my law practice. Uh, one case filed over and over again. Uh, usually, I think there were as many as 35 or 40 different lawsuits filed as a result of the original case. And eventually, uh, it was uh, ruled in, in my client's favor at the Arizona Supreme Court. And uh, unfortunately, uh, during that time period, many of the people participating on both sides of the lawsuit had died. And even if it's not over till it's over, and even then it might go on for a few years and years more. This is a reminder that even experienced trial attorneys have to use a dictionary. There's no out. There's no way around this. There's always going to be words that you don't know. And it's always going to be a, way, a need to, to get in and, and examine these records and try to understand what they're saying by looking at uh, a dictionary. And uh, if I'm doing genealogical research, uh, my years of practice do not prepare me to know all of the meanings of all of the old terms. So I'm still looking things up in dictionaries. Now, what are called causes of action? These are, these are the reasons why someone might bring a lawsuit. And they are, um, there's a lot of them. And I just touch a few of the ones that are more common. Personal injury or tort. Tort means personal injury. It's a legal term. A breach of contract, that means somebody's entered into a contract, buy a piece of property, sell a car, do whatever, uh, or build a house or build a bridge, who knows. Whatever there's a contract for. And for some reason, the, um, the, someone doesn't perform the contract according to its terms, so they bring a lawsuit for breach of contract. An accounting uh, that says that I think you owe me some money, so we're going to have an accounting and let's see if you can't, if you owe me money from whatever transaction. Trespass is an interesting one. Uh, historically, a uh, lawsuit could be filed for what's called trespass on the case, and that was just basically a personal injury type action. But today, trespass has a narrower meaning, and it usually means that someone's come onto a piece of property improperly and done some damage. Injunctions are non-damage cases. They're basically trying to get the court or the judge to order somebody to do or not do something. The most common injunction today is called a protective order. It's issued in domestic relations or in uh, justice courts, and the people uh, who are asking for it are, are wanting someone to be kept away from them and not make contact with them. There are many, many more causes of action. In fact, there are huge books of lists of all the different kinds of causes of action that can be, can be brought. And people are making up new ones all the time. OK, so how do we know a lawsuit's been filed? Well, first of all, if you see in a, uh, in a recording in a land and property, uh, if you're doing land uh, research into land and property and looking through the, the recorder's office looking for or recorded online recorded uh, documents and you find a recorded judgment or satisfaction of judgment, then you immediately know which case that there was a lawsuit and where it was filed and who were the parties. If there's a court of appeals case, then you obviously know there's a lawsuit as a, in the lower court has been filed. So there's a, a lawsuit that's being appealed to a court of appeals. If your ancestor died, most of your ancestors did die or you wouldn't be here. Uh, but um, if your ancestor did, uh, if your ancestor died or one of your relatives, for instance, not just ancestors, but all your relatives died, then there's very likely a lawsuit called a probate matter, which would uh, dispose of their estate after their death, either with or without a will. Divorces are an obvious uh, uh, flag that there is a court case out there to look at. And if someone is, says that they got injured, it's very likely that they may have gone to court either because they were 
being sued because they created the injury or they were suing because they wanted to get paid for the injury. Okay. Okay, well, now, how do we know if your ancestor's been arrested? Uh, generally speaking, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways that could occur. Uh, you and your family, but you and your family may not want to know that. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you know, it's, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's very disturbing to find out that some of your relatives or ancestors have been put in jail. Now, a criminal lawsuit or case uh, proceeds uh, with different, it's similar in, in, in structure to a civil lawsuit, but all of the levels and all the procedures and everything else are different and everything has different time frames and the whole thing. So generally speaking, in today's world, uh, there aren't too many lawyers who practice law, both criminal law and civil law at the same time, but uh, that is possible. Uh, first of all, a criminal lawsuit starts with an arrest. An arrest is a, is a technical term, even though uh, you may be asked on a form, have you ever been arrested? Well, the answer is, isn't as simple as you might think. If you're stopped on a traffic stop, for example, technically you were arrested because they stopped you. And an arrest is simply a, when you're detained uh, by a, 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 some kind of a, a officer of the law. A sheriff or a policeman or whatever. Now, what they're asking you, though, is if you were formally arrested, which means were you taken into the a court case or, I mean, into the uh, police uh, office or the jail or whatever, and uh, put through the whole process of being processed in. Now, uh, a, a criminal case after an arrest can, begun, can be begun by either an indictment which comes from a grand jury or an information which is lodged by some county attorney or state attorney or uh, federal attorney uh, office. So uh, there is a different way for these to get started, but it's called indictment. It's the same as a complaint, but it's actually called differently. And then there, each of the people who are subject to a lawsuit um, must go to, I mean, a criminal arrest must go through what's called a preliminary hearing, determine whether or not there's a sufficient reason to bind them over for trial. And, and a lot of cases are dismissed at the preliminary hearing level. You go into discovery, which is essentially the same thing as on a civil case, trying to find out what the other party knows. The case goes to a trial. There are post-trial motions. Uh, usually, automatically, in a criminal matter, there are a number of post-trial motions. And then there's a sentencing where the criminal is told what it's going to have to do, and they either go to jail or they end up paying a fine or both. So this is kind of the, the scenario for a criminal case, uh, understanding that criminal cases and civil cases may all appear in the same court case, one I mean, court trial one after another. And one lawsuit, in fact, or fact, can have both criminal and civil uh, considerations involved. So how do I know if my ancestor is a criminal? Uh, of course, if you find him in the prison or in jail uh, from on a census record, as like I have with, some of, with one of my ancestors, then you know there was probably a criminal case against that person. If you find a newspaper article referencing an arrest, trial, or conviction and sentencing, very good notice of there is a criminal action. And or other, if you find a court action, such as a divorce, you know if the person was divorced, they must have gone to court. So you might want to look and see if you can find the court record to find more information like uh, maiden names or the names of the children or other things that might appear in a divorce action. What if there's an appeal? Well, that's good news for attorneys. There's a great, uh, excuse me, for genealogists, there's, it's also good news for some attorneys. Other attorneys would just get really upset when they have an appeal on their case. Um, but there's a greater chance of finding a record of the proceeding because uh, these are what are called uh, the courts on appeal make a record. The record of the trial court might have been lost if there's an appeal. But good news, there's always more records. So we just keep looking and looking because we find it. Now on appeals, we have two kinds of courts. Courts of appeal 
versus courts that are not of, or courts of record that are, are courts that are not of record. Uh, courts of record, the appeals courts, write out their decisions and uh, publish them. Courts not of record, uh, all of the information goes into the court file, but it's never publicly uh, published or recorded. And so the court of appeal uh, records are more easily obtainable than any others. Uh, to, uh, the courts of appeal write out their opinions, like the Supreme Court writes out Supreme Court as decisions, and all of the state uh, appeals courts also do the same. Now, granted that reading old court cases may be difficult, as I mentioned, there may be words like writs or old pleading terms, and there's also changes in the rules of procedure and the statutory law over time that make things difficult. Some of the old criminal actions are no longer criminal. Some of the old uh, civil actions are no longer even noticed by, uh, recognized by the court. And there have also been changes in the usage of all of the common terms and a lot of obsolete terms. So it's, in a sense, it's, it's like I mentioned, it's almost like learning a foreign language. Now here's the, the key for attorneys. Where are the records? Uh, first of all, it's a good idea to search online by the name of the parties. It's very possible that you'll find a court. There's a, a new, new uh, sort of newer addition to Google called Google Scholar. It's been around a while, but what they've added now is Google Scholar now searches all of the appeals cases in the United States those that are on the state level as well as the federal level. Hundreds of thousands of cases searched by Google Scholar. Uh, I found it interesting because I put in my name and it pulled up all the cases I'd had on appeal during the time I was an attorney. Uh, if you can identify the court and research the history of the court in that county, then you might be able to find out where the records were kept. They might be in the state archives, they might be in the county archive. They might have been uh, destroyed. Uh, they might be available in the courthouse. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities, but it's going to take some, some uh, detective work and research in the history of the court. And the simplest thing, by the way, is to call the county for information about the location of the records. So if you, tra if you trace your person back to a county back in one of the other, in a state, then just get on the phone, get online, find out what the telephone number is for the county, and call the county directly. Now, many of the court uh, record uh, locations, as well as the county's records, are in what is called the FamilySearch.org Family History Research Wiki. If you go to FamilySearch.org uh, or Wiki.FamilySearch.org or go to FamilySearch.org and in the menu items under search, look for the wiki. Uh, it will usually tell you the status of the of the various case record uh, for the court records for particular counties without in, in out throughout the United States. Now, what is going to happen ultimately is you may have to travel because uh, not all the records have been digitized, not all the courts are very progressive and they may be in boxes in the attic or in the basement of the courthouse and they may stick you in there and say go out. Now the question has been asked a couple of times as to whether or not um, uh, you have to travel to get there and the answer is yes you might have to. So call ahead about hours, availability, and locations and the, the last thing is, don't give up. There are always more documents. Thank you for watching. This is another BYU Family History Library webinar. And remember, they are being uploaded to the, family his, the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and should be available for your review. Thanks. Thank you, James, for the webinar and for all of the wonderful information. We'd love to have your feedback and invite everybody to write us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu so we can make our webinars a little bit better. Um, and we will have to see you next time. Thank you.